So, um, welcome back. Uh, now that you're all so comfortable with graphs, we can move on into three dimensions. We'll skip two dimensions, go straight from one to three. <laughs> so, I'm going to talk about the doubled handle body model, which is, remind you, up is up here. This is one picture of it. And this is another picture of it. Where you're supposed to think this is in the three sphere and I've glued A to A bar, B to B bar, and C to C bar. So this is picture one, this is picture two, it's the same object. Oh, <laughs> okay, they're different objects, A, B, C. Uh, a prime, B prime, C prime, this is A union A prime, yeah, B union B prime, C union C prime. So this is kind of A and this is kind of, that's the front of A and that's the back of A. Okay, I'll just call them A, B, and C. Okay, so that's the model. Let me, uh, so we had these automorphisms, which, uh, let me just remind you, there was a sigma permutes the AI, iota I flips, uh, sends AI to AI inverse, rho IJ maps AI to AI AJ. And lambda ij maps ai to aj ai. Okay, so those are the automorphisms expressed in the in the generators. How do I model those in this picture? So um, uh, let's do the sigma ij's for sigma sigma first. Uh, well, it's pretty clear what you do. Uh, you just take a homeomorphism of this picture that permutes the A's, A's, B's, and C's. So if I uh, put A over there, B over here, and C over here, you should be fairly easy to convince yourself that what you have is homeomorphic to what you started with. Yeah? So there's a homeomorphism that does that that sends this guy to this guy, this guy to that guy, and that guy to that guy. Um, and similarly, uh, flipping A to A inverse, uh, let's put A over here, then it's really easy to think about that. So on the handle body picture, you just twist the handle body, twist both of them, uh, yeah, so that'll send the bottom to the top. Twist both of them and glue by the identity, and that's a homeomorphism. And uh, that sends AI, <coughs> AI. Choose a homeomorphism. that permutes the spheres A sub I. Oh yeah, I, I should, I guess in order to do that, I should explain how I'm identifying the fundamental group of my manifold with my generators. I've got, I'm gonna pick a point in that's uh, in the, that's not in one of the spheres and draw a loop That's A, that's B, that's C. So those three loops, if I choose, if this is my base point, I actually call it P maybe, uh, the, those three loop, loops generate the fundamental group of my handle body. 
And so each of these spheres uh, is dual to one of these loops. It punct the, the loop punctures the sphere exactly once. So if I permute these spheres, it's going to permute A and B. If I flip this sphere upside down, if I, if I flip this handle upside down, it's going to send A to A inverse. OK, is that, is that clear? I can, those, those things are, are supposed to be obvious. The one that's maybe not so obvious is these rho ij's, but it's actually not that hard. Uh, let me take, let me draw my handle body a little bit funny. Let me draw the um, AI sphere here. And the AJ sphere here. And then I have all these other spheres down here. And I've got generators, AI, and uh, AJ. OK, so in order to, um, I need a homeomorphism of this thing that's going to send the generator AI to the generator AI times AJ. So I claim what I can do is take this sphere. I'm basically going to take the connect sum of these two spheres. So I'm going to draw a little tube between them. And after I straighten out this tube, it will look like this. So I'm going to draw a little tube between them. And then I'm going to uh, mess around with that tube until it looks, till the, so that's, you know, if I take two spheres and I connect them by a tube, I still have a sphere. And then I'm going to push it out until it just intersects this half of my handle body in a disk, and I claim the disk will look like this. So this is a picture of AI connected sum with AJ. So I've taken those two spheres, joined them by a tube, and then made it look pretty for you. OK? Now I want to take a homeomorphism that interchanges the AJ sphere with the, uh, yeah, the AJ sphere with the, uh, interchanges these two spheres. So maybe I'll draw this in pieces. Let me first cut this open. mess down here. OK, so now I've got, uh, these are my, now I'm just going to switch these two spheres, switch these two spheres, do a little twist up here, do a little twist down here, switch these two and switch these two. And so that uh, this one, use, so this one, AI, AI connected some AJ will show up over here. And AJ will show up over here. And AI hasn't moved. I'll glue it back the same way it was before. And I won't do anything at all to these. OK, so that's, that's a homeomorphism. Now I'm going to glue them back together. I just, I just drew it apart because I thought it was easier to see what I was <coughs> twisting after I glued it apart, but I didn't really have to glue it apart. I could just say interchange these two spheres. But I guess I think it's sort of easier to see if I take it apart than twist here and twist here and glue back together. Um, anyway, so now I have a picture that looks pretty much like it used to look. but. 
These spheres have different names. This now is AI plus AJ. This is AJ, and this is AI. But let's look what happened to my generators. Of course, nothing happened to these guys. But what happened to this? What, this AI, it goes up to, it, it, first it hits the AI sphere, then it hits the AI plus AJ sphere, then it comes back to the base point. So over here, first it's going to go up to hit the AI sphere, then it'll hit the AI plus AJ sphere, and then it'll come back to the base point. Similarly, this one, what did it do? The AJ sphere went up and hit the AI plus AJ sphere, then it hit the AJ sphere, and then it came back to the base point. So first it hits the AI plus AJ sphere, then it hits the AJ sphere, then it comes back to the base point. Okay? So can you see that? So this orange, when I did this, and did this twist, and then did this, this is what happened to the uh, orange graph. So um, if I think of this as uh, uh, the same <laughs> manifold as this, with those things switched, then what happened is the AI I sphere got mapped to the uh, well, the AI plus AJ sphere. And the AJ, the, 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 I, the AI loop, it used to be over here, it got sent over here in this manifold. So it used to be over here, now it goes like that. So um, it, sent, it sent AI to AI plus AJ. AJ, on the other hand, got sent to its inverse. Okay, so that's a homeomorphism of my original manifold. This is what it does to the fundamental group. It sends AI to AIAJ and AJ to AJ inverse. It's not quite uh, rho IJ. That's if I compose this with iota J inverse, this goes to AI AJ inverse, and it goes to AJ, and this is rho IJ inverse. Okay, so if I had done this slightly differently, I would have got rho ij instead of uh, rho ij inverse composed with iota j. But this is the basic move. You take um, a sphere ai. So, so that's, that's uh, the basic move that homeo that's basically a diffeomorphism of the three manifold that realizes one of these uh, rho ij's. And let me just point out what I did in this picture. I had, well, this was an AI. <coughs> so I took these two spheres, AI and AJ, and I took their connected sum. So, you know, I do a little tube and I got this sphere. So in this picture, uh, of course, the a is, AI is glued to AI bar, AJ is glued to AJ bar. Um, and what I'm doing is switching this sphere with that sphere. and that performs that automorphism up there. So I take a homeomorphism of this manifold. I just got two spheres in the manifold. I'm performing it, taking a homeomorphism that switches the two spheres. And that's how I model uh, the rho ij's. Um, and <laughs> I realize that this is uh, hard to swallow if you haven't uh, thought about it before, so I want you to think about it a little. So an exercise on the exercise sheet is to uh, <laughs> explain how you would get, that was a, a right transvection, rho ij, explain how to get lambda ij.
What's different? What do you do different to get or to get rho ij instead of rho ij inverse? Okay, so um, after you've struggled with that for a while, you should be completely comfortable with with these pictures. So, whoops, we used uh, folds. Excuse me. Ah. So we used folds to prove that these guys generate. Um, odd of Fn. I should point out here that I'm being, I, I haven't, yeah, I guess I have been drawing a base point in my pictures, but I really don't think about these homeomorphisms as necessarily preserving base points. So I usually think about outer automorphisms instead of automorphisms. But maybe it's easier to see the automorphisms. So these generate odd of Fn, so they also So their images generate the outer automorphism group with just the quotient of odd of Fn mod inner automorphisms. So what this pictures prove is that the, the map from homotopy homeomorphisms, this is a homeomorphism that I've, I've described over here pi naught of homeomorphisms of Mn to out of Fn is on to. So that's theorem. So you have to combine that with the fact, so we know, we, we know all the generators of out of Fn, and we can uh, model each of them by a homeomorphism, so that means that map is actually surjective. So that's the beginning. So Whitehead knew this in the 1920s, 1930s. So Whitehead used this fact to, um, to study automorphisms of free groups. So These things are non-trivial automorphisms. Um, what do you mean? They're non-trivial automorphisms. So if a if a function has a, this is a non-trivial. Oh, they're not inner. These are not yeah, inner. Yeah, yeah abelianize. Yeah, abelianize. What happens to an inner automorphism? Okay. It's the identity on homology. And when you abelianize, these guys are not the identity on homology, so they're not inner. Good question. Thanks. Um, Whitehead in the 1930s uh, used this picture. To give an algorithm to decide whether a map phi is an automorphism. Now, I'd like to point out that we already have an algorithm to decide whether a map is an automorphism. Namely, um, <laughs> Stallings folding gives another one. Because if you take this map and that I described and try to start folding it, <coughs> it 
if uh, that's an automorphism, that's a homotopy equivalence. And every time you fold, uh, you'll preserve the fundamental group. And uh, yeah, if you get stuck someplace you can't fold, then you don't have an automorphism. I don't want to, actually, I don't want to, I don't want to dwell on this because I really want to concentrate on this. This is a, so Stallings folding gives another one, and Stallings fold also tells you how to factor your automorphism into a product of rows, lambdas, sigmas, and iotas. But this one is a, is a different algorithm, very different, and um, it's nice and easy to program a com on a computer, for instance, and gives you an easy test, immediate test, to see whether something's an automorphism. And the point is that uh, if it's an automorphism, so if the ith generator goes to some word wi, That's, uh, being an automorphism is the same sa thing as saying these w's form a basis. <coughs> so what Whitehead did is give an algorithm to decide whether a set of words is a basis or part of a basis. Um, okay. So the algorithm, yeah. So the algorithm is going to tell us whether a set of words is a basis. So how does that work? Uh, right. So given. So the idea is that it, we, we've got this, let, let, me st let me back up a bit. We have an automorphism. We, want to we have a map from Fn to Fn. We want to un understand whether it's an automorphism. We know from what we proved over there that if I have an actual automorphism, I can model it by a homeomorphism. So if uh, B is an automorphism. Model it by a homeomorphism. And I'm getting bollocked up with automorphisms versus outer automorphisms again. I'm really talking about automorphisms. And if you notice my picture up there, uh, I didn't move the base point. So actually, I've proved that that map is on too. I can do all these things without moving the base point. That's what I've actually proved. So let's just talk about automorphisms for now. So if he's an automorphism, model it by a homeomorphism, fixes the base point. OK, so here's my MN. I'm only drawing half of it. And I got some homeomorphism. I want to cut, I want to draw the picture I've been drawing up there. Namely, I'm going to redraw exactly the same picture, I guess. I'm going to choose n spheres and choose a dual basis. This picture is different because I'm calling them A1, A2, A3 instead of A, B, and C. So good thing I drew a different picture. OK. Um, right. 
And the other picture for this, I'm also going to draw. Those are my spheres. Here's my base point, P. And I've got a sphere, A, A1 goes in one side of A1 and out the other side. Uh, this is A1. A2 goes in, in one, one side of this and out the other side. And A3 goes like this. There's one picture, there's another picture. Okay. Okay, so now I'm going to apply my homeomorphism and watch what happens to the orange graph. I'm not going to, I'm, I'm going to keep the A's the same place they were before. I have a homeomorphism from this manifold to this manifold. I'm not looking at the moment at what happens to the spheres. I'm looking at what happens to the orange graph. What happens to the orange graph, well, P goes to P, um, but it gets all messed up. It does stuff. I shouldn't make it too fancy. Yeah, it does stuff. It gets messed up. This is a homeomorphism. It becomes some other graph, right? So now let me cut this open again and look at this picture. So P went to P, and this orange graph here got messed up. It goes all over the place. Maybe it looks something like that. Whoops. Actually, I'm going to prove that it can't look like that. But, okay. So uh, now, uh, yeah, now squint. I can do this. And make all those uh, those uh, spheres become just dots. And you get a graph. Yeah. I'm not going to draw it accurately. This thing is called Whitehead's star graph. <laughs> If you think about carefully what happened, you'll see that there is an edge from the sphere AI to the sphere AJ, if and only if um, AI AJ inverse occurs in some uh, w, K. So you can, you can um, check that if you want, but topologically the picture is clear. I have a manifold. I take a homeomorphism. I see what happens to the orange graph. It gets messed up. To the orange uh, graph, it gets messed up. And then I cut open along the, my canonical spheres and I get uh, a new graph called the star graph. And here's Whitehead's lemma. If 
if w1 up to wn is a basis, then the star graph has a cut vertex, other, which is not the base point. Okay, so a cut vertex is a vertex so that it, when you remove it from a graph, the graph divides into two pieces. Okay? I love this proof. Um, yeah, so that's what we're proving. Uh, yeah, proof. Why is the code vertex on the standard basis? Where's the what? On the, on the graph for this standard. Ah. Star graph has an outer vertex or is um, this. Thank you. <laughs> if, it, if you got this graph, you're happy. You got the basis. Right. So uh, why is this? Proof. What time am I supposed to stop? 11.30? Okay. Okay, so in that picture, all I, all I drew was what, picture, what happens to the, uh, the orange graph. Well, something also <laughs> happens to the sphere's AI. Um, proof. Give it a name. I guess I called it phi, which I shouldn't have. Okay, this 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 time it's going to be uh, more convenient to look at this picture. So under homeomorphism, a sphere is still a sphere. The image of a sphere is still a sphere. Uh, make and by general transversality th theory, we can isotope these spheres to be transverse to the spheres AI. Okay, so now I have a sphere running through this picture. F of AI is some sphere. It's got a different color. Um, and it's transverse to this, to this picture. And uh, I claim that that means that, yeah. So here's a, here's a piece of it. Maybe here's another piece. Uh, another piece, etc. I've got some surface here. It's a bunch of, it's a sphere cut into pieces by the circles of intersection. So here's my green sphere. It intersects the white spheres in a bunch of circles. The white circles cut the green sphere into planar surfaces, right? But the green sphere is still a sphere. So I've drawn here, you know, the complementary components are the planar surfaces. Here I've drawn them as they would appear inside this three manifold. They're, um, yeah, here's a pair of pants here, here's a pair of pants here, et cetera. But nevertheless, they are planar surfaces. And since this is a sphere, there have to be some disks. The innermost pieces are disks. Um, so, 
uh, f of a i uh, is a bunch is a union of planar surfaces, including at least two disks. Take innermost pick two things here, they have their disks. Can't put anything inside a disk. So there's at least two disks. Here's one in this picture. And there has to be another one, which I haven't got yet in the picture. Maybe it's here. So that's what, that's what f of ai looks like in this picture. Now let's uh, bring the orange graph back into play. When it started, a1 intersected f of, intersected a1, and it didn't intersect a2 or a3. So um, I'm going to continue over here. a1 intersects uh, a1, not a2 or a3. So supposing this is a picture of f of a1, then f of little a1 was this uh, guy. It intersects the green sphere at exactly one point. So it has to miss one of those disks. a1 in exactly one point. So f of a1 intersects f of a1, not f of uh, a2 or f of a3. Uh, similarly, f of b1 doesn't intersect f of a2 doesn't intersect uh, f of a1 and f of a3 doesn't intersect f of a1. So let's just look at f of a1. I've got my, um, my graph, wherever it is, and at most, so this is um, f of a1 union f of a2 union f of a3. That's my graph in this picture. It intersects at most one of these disks. So this whole thing misses d1 or d2. Say it misses d2. So whatever my graph looks like, it doesn't uh, intersect any of this green sphere. I have to be very careful how I draw it so I don't make it intersect the green sphere. Uh, it could intersect that disk in exactly one point, but there's no other points of intersection. Right? I'm not using anything deep here. Okay? Yeah. Just explain again this, what this D1 looks like. Are we saying that this third sphere is completely inside of this D1 in some sense? Um, no, okay. So this is my, uh, this is my sphere F of A1. I'm just looking at, I'm taking one of those spheres, my favorite sphere, say A1, and I'm looking at its image under this homeomorphism. So this is my sphere. Under this home, and I made it transverse to the, those original spheres up there. So, in particular, it intersects my original white spheres in circles. So now I've drawn these circles in this picture. Those are circles of intersection. In this picture, here's the circles of intersection. Uh, 
I haven't drawn enough of them, but they're there. Um, maybe I have drawn enough of them, I don't know. So this planar surface here, this is a surface of the green sphere. It's, uh, this is a pair of pants, so it might be this pair of pants, for instance. But there's at least two disks in this picture. So I've drawn two of them, here's one of them, here's the other one. Now, uh, so th this is a picture of the green sphere sitting inside my manifold. And now I want to look at my star graph. And the star graph is this, f of a1 union f of a2 union f of a3. All three of these things intersect um, f of a1 in exactly one point. So there's at least one of these disks, either this one or this one, that doesn't contain that point. And in this case, it's this one. Okay? So there's no point of intersection of my star graph with this disk. So I'm done because I'm done. <laughs> So um, that so so if the boundary of this disk, what did I call it, D two, is contained in that uh, this is A I bar, then A I bar is a cut vertex. Right? So I have this disk. I have this star graph. Uh, this disk may have other things in here. I have this star graph. Some of the star graph is outside this disk. Some is inside the disk. I don't know where the disk is. The disk might go up here. Some of it's outside, some of it's inside. This, this vertex cuts the graph into two pieces. So it's a cut vertex for the graph. Is that clear? Is that, does that, have I answered your question or not? Okay. How do you know there's stuff, there's stuff inside? Uh, how do I know there's stuff? Because there are vertices inside, because there are spheres inside. And if I missed a vertex altogether, I wouldn't have an automorphism. That would mean I had a set of words that didn't use a certain letter. So that's not going to be an automorphism. But good, good question. I remember you from classes. <laughs> <laughs> I was asking these good, obvious questions. Yeah. OK, um, then AI is a cut vertex. So that's the end of the proof. So the reason I, I said, pointed this out, this is just keeping track of what I did. Point is, if I have a set of words, it's, um, this is just thinking about what I did. This makes it easy to draw the star graph without drawing three manifold pictures. The three manifold picture gives you this really cute pr proof that there's a cut vertex. But um, in, 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 in order to actually draw the star graph, you don't have to um, draw the three manifold picture. So. Uh, so, so how do we turn this into an algorithm? Uh, yeah, so how do we uh, to turn this into an algorithm to decide whether something's a basis? Well, first you, you take a set of words, you draw the star graph. Is, if there's no cut vertex, then you don't have a basis. That's easy. But what if there is a cut vertex? What do you do? So let me tell you how to do the rest of the algorithm. And you get to do this in your exercises. So um, the algorithm. Uh, 
then uh, draw the star graph. No cut vertex. Other than the base point, then it's not a basis. What if there is a cut vertex? So here's the cut vertex. Uh, this one's a cut vertex. <coughs> cut vertex. Is my, oh, I erased the wrong picture. So I've just remember these, these points are, dots are really spheres. Supposing there's a cut vertex. Then I can draw a sphere that separates, draw a sphere. That separates, whoops, I forgot to draw the base point. Oh well. Uh, cut vertex A that separates A from its opposite number up here. Now I actually have two choices here. Uh, I could have drawn this one or I could have drawn this one. I think I want to use whichever one. Uh, I want. I think I want to use one that contains the base point, but I can't remember. Uh, if I'm thinking about outer automorphisms, I don't need a base point, and that's what I usually think about. But um, yeah, draw a sphere that separates A from A bar S. And now I'm going to do, so this is like the picture I had where I wanted to model the, the rho ij. I had um, you know, an ai and an aj, and then I took a sphere that, had, that separated ai from ai inverse, ai from its opposite sphere. And then what did I do? I exchanged those two spheres. So take a homeomorphism. Exchanging uh, A with S. Okay, so then I'll get a new star graph. So this one maybe I will try to do a little bit carefully. So I'm going to replace A by S. Everything else remains the same. So look what uh, the orange graph does. The fact that this is a cut vertex means that there are some edges inside, according to Joe, and there are some edges outside. And it, but the, the sphere uh, S intersects the orange star graph in fewer points than the sphere A did. So A intersects the, the, the star graph in all of these points. S misses that point. Star graph. The star graph. Um, intersecting S in fewer points. Uh, well, the star graph intersects S in fewer points than A. It's the same star graph, the star graph. Star graph intersects S in fewer points than A. So when you exchange A and S, you get this picture with S now replacing A 
and you have to draw the star graph. I don't know. These guys have the same valence. Um, S now has valence 1, 2, 3, 4, where A had valence 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Uh, I won't connect the dots, but that's, that's what this new star graph looks like. Um, and Can you actually connect the dots? I don't really understand what this process is. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, if you have uh, a, a, section, a segment of your, star, of your star graph going from uh, A to B. Uh, you still have A and B over here. It still goes from A to B. If you have a segment of your star graph that went from B to A through S, then now, now it goes from B to S and out S on the other side. And uh, yeah. So it goes, yeah, if you used to go from B to A, now it goes from B to S and out the other side. And uh, yeah. And th this guy, uh, yeah, what happens to this guy? You can draw a new star graph if you carefully look at what your old st star graph did. Um, so the intersections with these spheres haven't, ch so all this changes, you, you've switched one of the spheres with another one of the spheres. And uh, yeah, it's still, it's still the image of a bunch of loops. It still intersects these spheres and a bunch of points and you connect them when they connect to uh, spheres. I claim it's the same picture and I'm sorry, I can't, I've been talking for two hours. I can't be expected to do things like that at the end of two hours. Sorry. Yeah. I'm not sure if you said this, but do, it, do you need to specify that your sphere is separating one of the components of the complement? Uh, I, I wanted a sphere that separates A from A bar. Okay, so that guarantees that it's a non-separating sphere. The people in this room who know too much. <laughs> it's just that it seems to me you could draw other spheres in the graph that are separating A from A far, but also but not doing what you want. But also don't do what I want? Yeah, no, I want, I, I want uh, to separate. There are lots of spheres that separate A from A bar. The important feature of this sphere is that since it goes around the cut vertex, it misses some of the edges coming out. Okay, so that means that uh, that uh, it intersects the star graph, the, the, this image, in fewer points than the valence of this vertex. So I claim that that means that the new star graph, using this sphere instead of this sphere, will have smaller valence at S than we had here. So the valence of all the other vertices will be the same and uh, the valence at S will be smaller. Is that okay? <laughs> so I can't, I don't want to, the, the reason I needed a cut vertex was to get a sphere that intersected the graph in fewer points than the valence of A. Did you say a word? What happens to that rightmost? Yeah. <laughs> one that's inside of S. Right. Uh, it doesn't intersect S at all. So where is it going to be in the new star graph? Uh, will it be yeah, will it have any edges? It will definitely be somewhere in the new star graph, right? <laughs> I've done a, uh, I have to see what, so in order to answer your question properly, I would have to actually think about what this homeomorphism does to this star graph. And I don't think I'm up to that at the moment. But you agree that, I mean, I, ha I had this picture. That's how I got the star graph, as I applied that homeomorphism. Now I'm looking at some different spheres up there that still cut that thing into a ball. And I'm looking what happens under that homeomorphism to that uh, graph, and I get a graph that cuts, so I get a new star graph. So 
Topologically, it makes sense. Combinatorially, it gets confusing. And um, yeah, I don't think I can do that on, on in front of all these people. Okay. Does everybody agree that the picture is all I've done? All I've done is exchanged one of those spheres for a different sphere, a different non-separating sphere. And so there's still the the complement is still a ball. I still have a star graph. It's just a different star graph. And it intersects my sphere in fewer points. By because, yeah. This is still the image of that rose under the homeomorphism. It just and it intersects the sphere in fewer points than the old guys did. Right. So the claim is the star graph intersects this in fewer points. So uh, if it's if the new star graph doesn't have a cut vertex, then stop. Otherwise, repeat. until you get this guy. And then you know you had a basis. So the homeomorphism, of course, introduces, induces an automorphism of the free group. And so um, your basis will be transformed under this automorphism to a different basis. And what you're doing is transforming this basis over and over again until you get the standard basis by doing these, these uh, things. So this, this auto, the, the induced automorphism that, takes the, that switches A and S is called a whitehead automorphism. So for obvious reasons. Stop means it's not a basis, right? If you ever get a, a set of words that doesn't form a basis, so you take a set of words, you transform it by an automorphism. If it's not a, if it has a cut vertex, so so notice that this this lemma only goes one way. If it's an automorphism, if it's a basis, then there's a cut vertex. That's not an if and only if. You can have things that aren't a basis whose star graph also give you cut vertices. So you might have one of those by accident. But then if you transform them by enough of this type of automorphism, you'll eventually get something that doesn't have a cut vertex. And right, I think, uh, yeah, I think I, I'm going to stop there. <laughs> what I should do now is do some simple examples. That's what exercises are for. So yeah, sorry for that. <laughs>